Okay, um, this is in the series of uh, short videos we're doing. It's just background information, uh, help you with your surfing. And it's amazing, we're gonna talk about tides. Uh, tides are really technical. There's lots of really confusing things with tides. Dineural tides, sinereal tides, lots of stuff, but we're gonna keep it simple today and relate it especially as far as uh, surfing, uh, making the most of the tides, being aware of the dangers. What's really important to remember is that there is so much good information out there. Uh, there's some great YouTube videos uh, about tides, uh, really simple, that explain sun, moon, earth, how it all works. And I often ask people a question, what makes tides? And it's amazing the answers you get, even from kind of experienced surfers. But I have people say, oh, the wind, uh, la, 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 the swell patterns. No, it's gravitational pull. So let's look at tides and what makes the tides first? And it's a question I ask people. And if they've got it right, they normally will say the moon. And they're right. The moon is a major source of gravitational pull. Uh, then I ask them what kind of other gravitational pulls are there. And they'll kind of get down to sun, which is really important, and moon. And it's how these three bodies interact that affect the difference in tides. We have our tides because of the moon, but the difference in tides is their alignment, sun, moon, and earth. So then I ask people, uh, what's a spring tide? How many times a year do we get a spring tide? You'd be amazed how many times people say, oh, once? Well, it sounds like it, because it's spring. But in fact, we get a spring tide, I'll explain what it is now, 24 times a year. And this is what happens. Here is our sun, here is the moon, and here's the earth. And two times in uh, a month, these will align in different ways. Firstly, with the spring tide, two times a month, they're completely in line, which means the biggest amount of gravitational pull, you've got the sun with its pull, the biggest pull is here from the moon, Two times a month, you get this really big pull on the surface of the Earth. Now, the Earth's got its gravitational pull. It's keeping the waters on it, so you get a bulge one side and the other side. Don't worry too much about the bulge of the water at the moment. But what's really important, this is when I'm going to get the most of spring tide, the most water goes up a beach, and the most it goes out. Now, that might substantially affect the place you're surfing. Often with spring tides, we might get our biggest currents or rips in the water because I've got to get a lot of water up the beach and then a lot of water out. There's more water moving. So a spring tide. Now, if you were having a nice walk and it was a, a, a clear night, it's uh, no clouds, and you looked up during a spring tide, there's two things you'd see. Firstly, you might see a full moon. That's a spring tide period. Or you might see no moon at all. All right, that's called a new moon. That's also a spring tide period. So, you know, you haven't even got to think really about uh, having a tide chart. You know, our ancient sort of forefathers and mothers, they looked at the sky and they could tell from the moon cycle when a spring tide was. And this happens as well with the opposite of the spring tide, spring tide, which happens two times a month as well, called a neap tide. Um, I found out recently what neat meant and it was, I think it was a Scandinavian thing for not very much and it's a not very much tide. The neat tide, the sea doesn't go that much up the beach and it doesn't go that far out. Don't forget this could be reef or whatever, you know. And this is what happens. Here's our sun, here's our earth and there's our moon. Now they're completely out of line this time. So the least amount of gravitational pull is uh, executed on the, the waters of the earth so I don't get that much uh, movement. Again, this might seriously affect the places uh, where you surf. I know reef breaks here. I was surfing one yesterday that's always better on a deep spring tide at low tide. It was kind of a half a neap yesterday, and it got to low tide, and it wasn't as good as it would have been on a spring tide. This is, this is how, how it happens. Okay, now, I ask people very often, like, how many tides do you get a day? And again, you get some flipping different answers there, but uh, how many high tides and how many low tides? Well, it's, you get two. You get two high tides and two low tides. 
Don't forget, there are other tidal systems. We're not going to talk about that today in the world. You've got sinuoidal, dinuoidal tides. And I know a place in the UK, for instance, that get four high tides and four low tides uh, on the Isle of Wight. Really weird stuff going on. But the standard is for us. We're going to have two high tides and two low tides, okay? So, how many hours between high tide and low tide? Now, it's pretty simple. If there's two in a day, you can work it out to uh, six. But it's not an exact six. Uh, that's due to a wonderful guy called Pope Gregory and stuff like that. Uh, he changed tides, he changed our calendar. What we have now is what's called a Gregorian calendar. So, we got leap years coming along. And in leap years, we miss a day or two days, and that's where there's not an exact kind of six hours between each uh, tidal movement. Okay. But if it was high tide today at two o'clock in the afternoon, uh, and you come back the next day, what time in the afternoon would be high tide? And it's an hour on. And it's just about an hour. It's not an exact hour. It can be like almost three quarters of an hour or right up to an hour. So it moves on an hour every day. Now that's really important for you because like that really nice surf spot that you enjoyed surfing at two o'clock in the afternoon or five o'clock in the morning or whatever time it was, you gotta get there an hour on and an hour on. You're always chasing the tide. Now the tide, we'll talk about this in a minute, but the tide also moves at various speeds. Now it's called the rule of twelves, and it, can, it says that there's six movements between a low to a high and a high to a low. For each complete cycle, there's twelve movements. And I always draw a diagram of this to keep it simple. Um, so let's have a look at it now. Here's a box, which is really, let's say it's a beach. I'm going to split this box into six separate areas. It's really funny, I was talking to an experienced surfer today, really experienced surfer, I never knew that this existed. And it's really important to us. So here's our low tide and here's our high tide. At the low tide, yeah, for about three quarters of an hour, don't forget this is connected to another six movements and another six movements. but. At the low tide, the very point of low tide, for about three quarters of an hour here, the surf, the, the, sorry, the sea is very slowly moving. And it almost seems to stop for about 15 minutes. Okay, after that three quarters of an hour-ish, and this is an ish for all beaches, it starts to speed up. Yeah? So here I've got about an approximate hour and three quarter period, yeah? After that hour and three quarter, bang, it's like somebody put a switch on and it races up and it races up that beach. There's our half tide period, that's three hours kind of there. And here we go, an hour and three quarters before our um, high tide, it starts to slow down in this period. And that's about an hour. And for three quarters an hour, it's quite slowly moving. It's funny, I had an old Devonian guy, he was a fisherman. He said to me once, he said, son, it's like an old horse. Old horse can't gallop straight away. The first thing it does is walk, then it has a bit of a trot, and then it can gallop. And when it wants to stop, it doesn't stop straight away, it has a bit of a trot, and then it can slow down, you know? So this is really important to us. Now, when would we get the most rips, currents, well, it's pretty obvious where I got the fastest moving period. Now, that's not a general rule for all beaches, but it, you kind of can work on it. Um, so when am I going to get the most rips? When will I get the most sideways movement? Especially when you're a beginner and you're in the white water and you don't want to be moved around too much. That's really important that you understand this. Now, there's always a big safety side to surfing. You know, you could see the families. We used to see them years ago, and they'd come down the beaches, and they've got the, the radio there, and Granny's gone to sleep and everything, and they get covered by water. And everybody's picking up the blankets. You've seen it. You might have done it yourself, you know? Surfers do the same silly things. I've seen surfers surfing like a reef break, and there's no way they should have stayed in in the next section of tide, and suddenly the water's got too high at that reef or too low, and they're in the rocks. Uh, I know a place in uh, the west country of uh, Britain where these people walk past these rocks and regularly, about an hour later, they hit the rocks. They just forget the sea is moving. So here it happens. Uh, you get a little bank of pebbles and people will often, they're riding in, they've been on sand, they forget there's tide movement. They're just beginners and they jump off and hit the stones. Oh, there's stones. 
where you're in when you're surfing is constantly moving. So you've got to think of the safety issues with that. But what's super important too is wave quality. Now for every beach in the world, I don't know any beach or reef really, there might be some that is great for every stage of the tide. Rising tide, dropping tide, it's always great. There's normally a better tide for that beach. And it might be a better tide for your ability level. For instance, I know another beach in the West Country which is low tide, it's really barreling and you know a heartbreaking wave. And because people think, oh, that's when it's good, all the good surfers go there then, and their beginners and intermediates, they go there. That's crazy. The same beach at mid and high tide is a much easier learning beach. So this is what you've got to do. I write the Storm Rider Guide for this island of Lanzarote. And what we do, we put in the correct tides for each surfing spot. But get local information as well. The internet's incredible. And it starts telling you what is the best tide for you. And then find out, well, hang on, I'm like intermediate or I'm beginner or well, I might be an expert. When is the best tide at that beach for me and my level? I mean, there's nothing worse than surfing for two hours or three hours. You're super tired. Tired, you get out the water and everybody's arriving. And you can see the surf's getting better and you're too tired to make the most of it. Or the other way around, you get there, I think this is worse, <laughs> everybody's getting out. And they go, oh, you missed it. It was really good on the mid tide, but now it's high, it's not so good. So find out for every beach you go the best tide. We live our lives as surfers around the tides. One last thing I'll add, internet's fantastic. You know, and I also use one of these, which is a tide watch. Um, you know, even yesterday surfing, I was out in the water and said, well, what is that? And I was able to check it. There's various tight watches on the market and they can really, really help you on your surf trips and stuff. So, we surf around the tides, we live around the tides, get used to them, read them, and uh, on your surf trips particularly. If it means you've got to get up at 6 o'clock in the morning to surf that, do you do it? You know, don't, you, you, the tide, they used to say, tide and time wait for no man. And that's for sure in surfing. Thanks.